The next writer is Pliny the Younger, who uh, was governor of Bithynia, uh, that's northwest Turkey, around the year 113 through 111 through to 130. So let's split the difference and put this letter that he writes to the emperor in the, at the year 112. It's a public letter, but he's writing to the emperor asking for advice on how to deal with those awkward Christians. And so this is what he says. We're about 80 years after Christianity began at this point. I interrogated these people as to whether they were Christians. If they confessed, I interrogated them a second and a third time, threatening punishment. If they persisted, I ordered them to be led off, namely to execution. As for those who denied that they were or ever had been Christians, when they invoked the gods in words given by me, and prayed with incense and wine offerings to your statue, which I had ordered to be brought for this very purpose, along with the images of the gods, and also cursed Christ, which it said that no true Christian could ever be compelled to do, I thought they should be discharged. So you can see he's a nice guy. Um, you know, if, it's only the people who persist as Christians that we want to kill. If they renounce the faith, that's all right. So he's got some tests for whether people are Christians or not. And one of the tests is, are they prepared to worship the emperor? Are they prepared to worship the Roman gods? And another one is, are they prepared to curse Christ? Now, the logic of those first two, are they prepared to worship and use particular words and sacrifice to emperor, gods, and so on? The logic of that is that, of course, a real Christian can't do that. That's the logic of Pliny's test. Why else would he apply it? And it fits with something we know about Judaism. Now, I won't patronise you with asking how many gods Jews believed in, because you know that the basic answer is one. Uh, and one of those things about Jews uh, that was so prominent is that, of course, they did not worship any other being. So it seems here we have, in the most natural reading of things, knowing that Christianity began as a movement from within Judaism, the most natural reading of things is that that belief has continued. They are still only prepared to worship one God, and uh, that, that is one of the reasons that Christians can be, uh, people can be shown not to be Christians if they worship other gods. He then continues. Others named in the document, there was a particular document denouncing people as Christians. Others named in the document said that they were Christians, but later denied it, saying that they had been but they'd ceased three years ago, or many years ago, or even as much as 20. So we go back, if you like. It's not quite strict maths, but let's go from mathematics. Math. You can call it math, but we've got an S in Britain. Don't know why. Can't count, maybe. Um, going back to the year 112, and we're somewhere around the year 92, if we go back 20 years, here we have reports of what people who had renounced the Christian faith reported went on in their meetings. And... You know, a, a, the straightforward way of reading Pliny is that this was the way meetings had been going on for a long time. So back, if you like, we have a, a description of a first century Christian meeting, almost, in this text. They said that this had been the full extent of their guilt or error. They'd been accustomed to sing, to meet on a fixed day before dawn, and to sing antiphonally, one group to another, a song to Christ as to a God, and to bind themselves by an oath not to some crime, but rather not to commit theft, robbery, or adultery, not to break their trust, and not to refuse to return a pledge when asked to do so. So a certain amount of honesty emphasized in their meetings, but one of the striking things is here they are, worshipping Christ as a god, and of course he's writing in Latin, so there's no word a, so whether quasi deo means as to a god or as to god, we can't really decide, but we do know that of course Jews only believe in one god. And we've just been thinking about how one of the tests for whether someone's a Christian is, are they prepared to worship another being? And the very next thing we find out is here these Christians are worshipping God. And they're worshipping Christ as God. It's quite striking to me, because it seems that here we have evidence from a non-Christian text of the early inclusion of Christ uh, as one to be worshipped. Now, a common view of how this has happened is that gradually over time, people came to have more and more exalted views of Christ. Perhaps at one stage, they viewed him as sort of semi-divine, and then eventually, um, over a long period of time, exalted to God himself. 
The problem with this is, in one sense, the nature of the divine. You see, for the Jews, there is only one God, and there isn't a quality of the divine which can be inferred, um, uh, uh, um, um, bestowed onto people. You, you, you can't have a half God. You can't have a divine being in the sense that the Greeks could have. If, you know, if Jesus looks down, finds a pretty woman, gets together, and you can produce a half God. That's possible because divine um, uh, being is, is, is a sort of essence. One of the points that's been made powerfully by Richard Borkham in his book, God Crucified, a, a beautiful, just 100 page book but with a very profound argument, is how in, uh, amongst the Jews there was a divine identity, and that was uh, the focus, not on divine essence. And therefore, if they are worshipping Christ, it is because they have identified Christ as that God, not that he is on some journey gradually to be exalted as God. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.